So, talk about bridges for 15 minutes. That's what they told me. And I thought, well, then they don't know what linguists are really good at. Because <laughs> the closest that I ever came to building a bridge in my professional career was this. And it was meant to be a tree, not a bridge. So I guess <laughs> I'm not the right person to talk about bridges. But I've always wanted to stand on this red carpet, and I have done so now. So, <laughs> thanks and bye. <laughs> no, of course not. There are some other bridges I can tell you about. And those bridges are bridges of language, of course. You might have guessed that from my profession. <laughs> and bridges for a better way of learning, a more brain-friendly way of learning, and bridges for more diversity in places where diversity is technically non-existent due to their geographical position or due to their political background or due to their demographic structure. And I know, especially for you maybe, <laughs> These bridges might seem a little bit plain today, from today's perspective. But in the time and place, when and where, I managed to connect those dots. They really had a huge impact on some people's lives, and that's why I want to share them with you. Um, so, in the time and place, when and where, that requires me telling you where I come from, more or less, or where I live, <laughs> and where I do that magic. Uh, I never liked that. I never liked having to, peep to tell people where I come from, because it's a really boring place. It's very far off anything, and it's really very, very unremarkable. And uh, make that story a bit more fun about where I come from, I used to tell people, well, I come from a little place called Grefentonna, and it's actually almost the exact geographical middle point of Germany. So take a map of Germany, take a ruler, top to bottom, left to right, and you know where I live. <laughs> so that's more like a fun fact, you know, <laughs> instead of saying, well, it's just in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> but it is. The reason why people actually come to visit Grefentonna nowadays is because we are a lost place. It couldn't be more literal than that. <laughs> we are a lost place. Um, we are famous for this old prison. It's as sad as that. It doesn't become more exciting. Um, I'm telling you this to make you understand, you know, I went to school and learned English, and while I did so, while I was a schoolgirl, this prison was still full of prisoners. I can see <laughs> some of you reconsidering my age now. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. And so, <laughs> in my childhood, in that place, not in that prison, but in the village where that was, <laughs> luckily, <laughs> actually meeting an English-speaking person in real life was like opening your front door to a time-traveling prehistoric scientist. Same thrill, but also the same probability, unfortunately. But I told you, I did learn English, and I did like it a lot, and I wanted to try it out on real people. Because, I mean, that's what you learn the language for, don't you? To connect to other people. And my problem with this was, first, my problems. <laughs> first, as I told you, there were no other people to speak English to in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of Germany. Second, English at school was not really taught in that place, in that time with the idea in mind that it might actually be used for real-life conversation. It wasn't meant to be that way. And thirdly, 
even after the political change, when people actually could visit Grefentona from faraway places, no one did. Because that prison I showed you earlier wasn't the lost place just yet. <laughs> so I was, in the right, I was in the wrong time, in the right place maybe, but in the wrong time. And um, of course, when it was possible, I did travel, I did go out there into the world. I told you I wanted to try out my English, and so I traveled. And I met some thrilling people, and I had some great conversations, and shared some great cultural backgrounds, and I got my English up and fluent. But I, was, I have always been very, very attached to my hometown, to that region where I come from, not only to the region, to my family, of course, to my friends, to my neighbors. So I stubbornly tried to create that international lifestyle, that diversity in the place where I lived. I didn't want to move away there, just for that little bit of diversity. And I think I've always been a very stubborn child, so I kept to this mission. And um, for this mission, you need to know the next problem that I was faced with because I told you I wanted to keep my English up and going. But even if this tray chic little dress here maybe might hide the fact today, hopefully does, <laughs> but in that time when I wanted to keep my English up and going, all those little helpers that we have today did not exist yet. There was no YouTube, no language learning apps, no video blogs, no spontaneous video phone calls from your mobile device to anywhere in the world at any time of day. All these things did not exist yet. So I was like a little bit too early with all my fancy ideas. Um, but life had another opportunity for me in stock, which at that point I didn't even know of yet. And I want to share this with you. <laughs> so, this is the time and place I call pre-technology middle of nowhere. <laughs> that was the time <laughs> I had my English up and going and no one to talk to <laughs> because of the reasons I told you. And I promised you to show you the great opportunity that life had in stock for me right there. And it was this. So this is me. Well, it's not me, it's me from the inside. <laughs> when I learned I was pregnant, I decided this is my golden ticket. He will be my English-speaking communication partner. <laughs> For free, not quite unimportantly. Forever. <laughs> <laughs> and always. Poor boy, he couldn't run away from it, really, could he? So, there was my opportunity, and I took it. For him, it was at times slightly embarrassing, because remember where we live? Middle of Germany, German family, native language, German. No international people around us, but me stubbornly speaking English to that child. Well, it did make us the odd ones out sometimes. But it was important for me because the first stone for my bridge to connect those extremes was laid. And then some real magic happened. Because at that time, technology grew explodingly fast. And the little language school I had opened at the beginning of my career grew too. And my son grew, and I gr No, my ideas grew along with the technological possibilities. And so today, in Grefentona, in the middle of nowhere, I managed to create a constant flow of international visitors to our home and to my little school. So there were teachers coming, assistant teachers, friends from friendships I had made earlier, uh, friends who became teachers, but also teachers who became friends. So my little son 
very soon got used to people from different countries walking in and out our house on a regular basis, having tea and dinner with us and communicating in English to them, trying to communicate in English to them became normal for exchanging ideas and stories, even before he had his very first English lesson at school. And I would like to emphasize this last point. Speaking English in order to connect to people became normal for us as a family, not really learning the language to academically succeed at that school subject, which not always 100% happened for him either. But anyway, um, so I tried to expand this diversity and this way of using the language to my school and to the customers of my school, mostly adults. And um, I tried to encourage them to start using English as a tool for communication instead, instead of uh, an academic um, goal you have to reach. And I wanted to lead a school where my students English by just using it with the goal to connect to other people instead of by counting mistakes and trying to enforce flawless grammar. And so, together with my colleague Almudena Nunez from Mexico, I developed a way to fully immerse into English without even having to travel anywhere specially designed for adults in regions like Grefentona, whose threshold to connect with the world is still very high. And um, Almo is a certified yoga teacher, and in those yoga lessons, she speaks English only. The people who visit those lessons usually don't speak English at all, or very little. And if that sounds paradox to you, it made perfect sense to me. Because in yoga, language learning is so much easier. In yoga, everything that is explained can be seen. The cycles are repeated again and again. And also in yoga, you focus on the activity, on the physical activity. That's where the focus is. Not on the language and on potential mistakes you might make. So that's the magic that takes away the fear of speaking English immediately. And people can take their time. They can watch and listen passively for as long as they choose. That's the other magic trick. And the best feedback I got from one of the ladies in one of the courses was, Natalie, I'm so grateful to what you do here. You bring the world to Grefentona. And upon entering your classroom, I literally step into a different country. And then I realized I had built this bridge not only for me and my family, but also for the students in my school and for the people around me. And when I had realized that, I knew I want to go on. Um, I think it would be great to adapt this way of immersive learning to schools in general. Why should we always judge students about the mistakes they make, with the amount of mistakes they make or don't make? Why don't we just encourage them in their strengths and passions and interests instead, instead of counting their mistakes? Because, you know, mistakes, what we learn from a mistake is a thousand times more valuable than what you can learn from any textbook in the world. And so the mistakes, they are our free teaching and learning material always with us, always ready at hand. And I see mistakes like my right leg here. <laughs> it's obviously not quite as it was meant to be originally, I guess, <laughs> by the designers. But um, it's like a language mistake, you know? It's like a little grammar mistake or a little accent that people maybe find hard to understand. That's the equivalent of it. Because 
in, an, in a respectful and open and friendly conversation, no one focuses on the mistake instead of the message that is being carried around, right? And so it's the same with this leg. No one has ever mistaken it for anything else but a leg. <laughs> and no one has ever doubted it's a leg. That's the same, isn't it? And so I think teachers at school, we should do the same. We should be respectful and open and friendly. And can you remember the guy from the ultrasound photo? <laughs> so I have to share some more facts with you. I told you, he not always 100% succeeded with the academic um, goals of English at school and reaching good marks, maybe. But he's always succeeded in connecting to other people using that language, English, as a tool. And he did so quite successfully with people coming from anywhere in the world. And I think we could all do so too. It would do our schools some good. So let's be as diverse a society as possible. Let's learn immersively wherever possible and applicable. And let's just celebrate each and every mistake for what it really is. A great chance to personal growth. Thank you. <laughs>